Tests, one, two, test, test. All right. Morning, everybody. This morning, our Old Testament reading will be out of the book of Joshua, chapter 9, and I will be reading uh, from verse 1 through 15. Now it came about, oh, turn it down, Ted. Now it came about when all the kings who were beyond the Jordan, in the hill country and in the lowland, and on all the coasts of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite heard of it, that they gathered themselves together with one accord to fight with Joshua and with Israel. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they also acted craftily and set out as envoys, and took worn-out sacks on their donkeys, and wineskins worn out and torn and mended, and worn out and patched sandals on their feet, and worn out clothes on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and had become crumbled. They went to Joshua... They went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, We have come from a far country, now therefore make a covenant with us. The men of Israel said to the Hivites, Perhaps you are living within our land. How then shall we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, We are your servants. Then Joshua said to them, Who are you and where do you come from? They said to him, Your servants have come from a very far country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard the report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions in your hand for the journey, and go to meet them, and say to them, We are your servants. Now then make a covenant with us. This our bread was warm when we took it for our provisions out of our houses on the day that we left to come to you. But now, behold, it is dry and has become crumbled. These wineskins which we filled were new, and behold, they are torn. And these, because, or I'm sorry, and these our clothes and our sandals are worn out because of the very long journey. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions and did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the leaders of the congregation swore an oath to them. It's here that they didn't seek counsel from the Lord. I was uh, reading in the Old Testament this morning as well. And um, the Lord in the Old Testament told them, he told the Israelites, he says, you can make a covenant with the people that are outside the land that I'm going to give you. And he says, these are the terms that you can accept. But the people inside your land, you shall utterly destroy the wicked so they don't well among you so they didn't take counsel with the lord and they got they got fooled here people would put on old clothes and worn out sandals and went to the house of israel and said we traveled a long ways but yet they were just down the street and they and then they, israel makes this covenant with them and they get in trouble because they didn't seek counsel from the lord well anyways here we are uh let's pray for the for the sermon and for for the continued fellowship with the Lord. Lord, um we just come before you, Lord, and Lord, we just thank you, Lord. And so often we make uh decisions, big decisions without seeking your counsel. And Lord, um please forgive us for that. And Lord, help us in the future to um to have that desire to um to seek your counsel, Lord. To know from right and wrong. To know what we need to do, Lord. And Lord, as we go forward with this message, Lord, I ask that it touch hearts and open minds. And Lord, that you would be um, uh, manifested in your glory through these words, Lord. Lord, it's not about earthly glory. It's not about earthly things, Lord. But it's about you and your eternal glory. In Jesus' uh, name we pray. Amen. All right, I got First Peter chapter 1. I think there's only five chapters in in First Peter, so we should be done in about a year or two. No, I'm just kidding. We're, we're actually going to cover uh, five verses today. 
And we're going from verse 20 to 25. I have the ESV up here on the, on the screen. I, I have the New King James here and the ESV. I want to read the first sentence out of um, both. It says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And the English Standard Version says, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you. Verse 21, Who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and the abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and, it, and all its glory is like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Wow. I mean, the word of the Lord remains forever. I can't wait to get to that part of the sermon. Um, but the first part is talking about verse 20. It says, foreknown. And the uh, New King James says, foreordained. Um, he was foreknown before the foundations of the world. I don't think there's much of a difference here in the wording. It is... Obviously, it's two different words, but I mean, as far as meaning goes, um, foreordained, you know, you think about it, ordained means to, uh, to, to, to appoint, ordain. You know, God appoints certain things to occur, but it also um, means to appoint as priest, and uh, what, what this for means is beforehand. So either Christ was appointed beforehand to be our priest, which is true, or Christ was known by God beforehand, which is also true. I mean, Christ is a part of the Trinity. So uh, both of them are true. So you got the ESV and the NASB as foreknown. The King James is foreordained. But I want you to ponder this for a minute. Let's, let's, think, let's think about this for a minute. So Jesus was foreknown by the Father before what? Before the foundations of the world. That sounds like a verse we quote a lot about our salvation. So Christ was foreknown by the Father. Well, what's this mean? Think about it. Before God creates anything... He has foreknown his son Christ, Jesus Christ, and foreordained everything that should take place. Before the angels were made, before the earth was made, before Adam and Eve was made, he has foreknown Christ. See, a lot of times today, we think that Jesus is plan B. I mean, you hear this. Across the, the preaching today and across the radio and the TV, that, that, well, things just weren't working out the way God wanted them to, so he had to send the flood. Or he had to send the Jesus to die on the cross because things just weren't working out. Um, in a sports game, you, you think about it. When you call timeout, you know, we've been watching basketball, and Roy, I'll tell Roy's been a big help to me because I don't know, the, I didn't know the first thing about basketball when I first moved here. I mean, we, I was from Pittsburgh. And all we had was hockey, and we had the Steelers, and, and uh, we had those sports teams, but not basketball. But you think about it, when you have a basketball game, they call timeout, and what do they do? They draw on that board, and who knows what they say. It's just like a bunch of scribble to me. 
But they draw on this board and they come up with the plan B. Because plan A is not working. So somebody's open over here, so they have to have a plan B to cover that guy. And a lot of times we bring God down to our level, and we think that he's developing plans as we go along, but he's not. There's no plan B with God. There's just the plan. And nothing goes astray. You know, a lot, we don't give God the credit. We think that just because something bad happened, we think that's outside of God's will. So, uh, you know, we, we'll get to watch the Super Bowl here soon. And when they go into halftime, a lot of times when a team is, is winning and the other team goes into halftime, they come out with this plan B and they counteract what the other team is doing. That's not what God's doing. Sometimes we think that, that uh, there's this massive chess match, match between God and the devil. In, in, in some moves, God, God's winning. In other moves, the devil's winning. That's not how it works. I want you to think, think about this. The verse here is saying, God foreordained the sacrifice of his son before he created anything. Foreordained it. Foreordained every, it's not like God learned something and said, oh, I'm going to have to change the way I'm doing things. God doesn't have an improvement plan. He's perfect in all his ways. Okay? So, what is God in control of? I mean, you think of it. What is God in control? And then you ask that question, what is God not in control of? And you would ask, if God is not in control of something, what's the limit on that? Can, can there ever be a time where something goes wrong that it just spirals out of place where there's, there's this, where, where now it's no longer God's plan? Is there a random chance? There's no random chance. So... But see, a lot of times in our life, we'll ask, why did God allow this, or why did God allow that? Why did he allow certain things? If God is in control of everything, then why do certain things happen? Certain hard things that happen, but yet God is still in control. I will tell you, a lot of Christians shriek at that. They don't want to they don't want to they don't want to face that. Because there's a lot of evil out there. And you say, well, if God is good, how come there's so much evil? But let me tell you something. If if you give up the fact that God controls everything, God allows certain things to happen, if you give that up, you have no hope. Because even though there's so much evil out there, if you give up the fact that God is, that God is reigning and ruling sovereignly and allowing certain things to happen, then, then what's the limit to all this? Does God even win in the end? He loses the chess, chess match, in your opinion. He, he has the possibility of losing? No way. He's not even playing chess. Put it this way. You could, God could have killed the snake before he talked to Adam and Eve. Could have wiped them out. My wife, she'll call me, hey, get rid of that snake. Now, get rid of him. Maybe that's why. But you think about it. Why did God create the snake? Why? All this is leading up to God's glory. And we look at it, we're such small creatures, it's so hard for us to see the big picture of things. So, this leads me into the will of God. So, you ask yourself, why, why is there certain things out there? And what is the purpose of all this? Well, first of all, I'm not going to be able to answer that question in total. As a matter of fact, there's just some things that are secret that God doesn't reveal to us. And uh, the secret things belong to the Lord, the Bible says. But he has revealed his will to us in his word. And there is a couple wills of God. When they study God, when we study God, we'll see a couple things. We see the will of God 
there's one type of will that's perfect, decretive, sovereign, ultimate, or hidden will of God. And in this type of will, God sovereignly brings to pass everything, whatever He chooses, whatever He pleases, in that will of God. It, in, in Psalms 115.3, our God is in heaven. He does all that He pleases, right? Well, the fact that there's evil out there and somebody's going to commit evil, God could strike that person down before he commits evil. But he allows it to happen. In a sense, when he allows it to happen, he's permitting it to happen. Why? Because there'll be a judgment day where the wicked are judged. And God gets the glory in that even. And he gets the glory in... Him providing grace to people who shouldn't have grace. Now these are tough subjects. But Ephesians 1.11 says, In Him we have obtained inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things to the counsel of His will. So we see in a sense the, in the Word of God that all things work out to the counsel of His will. That's His perfect will, His decretive will, His sovereign will. Nothing happens that's outside of his control. And let me tell you something. That's very important to believe in. Because if you, don't, if you believe that something can happen outside of God's control, then what's the limit of bad things that can happen to you if God doesn't put a control on it? Number will number two is a perceptive or a revealed will. A precept. Precept. What is precept? Precept means a law, a rule. God reveals His will to us in His Word, in His laws, His prophets, and all this stuff. So we have precepts. Now, the will of God that's perfect, that's sovereign, will, will never go awry. Nothing can, can, can thwart that will. The preceptive will, pre, the preceptive will, He's given us commands, right? His will is that we don't break them, right? We have the power to break them, but not the authority. We, we break his, his will is that we do not covet, that we do not sin. But yet we break that. Now, he could destroy us right now for breaking any of those rules or laws that he has. You know, and he could have made a world where there's no sin. There's no sin in heaven. There's no sin up there. But yet he chose not to. We live here in this fallen world. And I heard somebody say the other day, well, well we're not really fallen. We just choose to do evil. I'm like, okay, well, that's, we're, we're fallen and we choose to do evil. Put it, can you name one person that's never sinned? If, if it was possible to not sin, name one. <laughs> you can't. Either that or you're delusional. Everybody is sin, has, has sinned. And we're all born under Adam. See, that's how we're saved. If Adam's our representative in sin and death, under the headship of Adam, we have a, he, a federal head, of representative. Under Christ is grace and salvation. So we're moved from the column of under Adam, sin and death, to the column of Christ, grace and salvation. And if Christ can, if Adam can represent us in sin and death, then Christ can represent us in, in grace, in salvation, by being perfect where Adam was not. Now, look here, it says, well, why would he foreordain all this stuff? Why, why would he foreordain the cross? Why would he foreknow Christ to the point where he knows everything is still created? His glory. John 7, 39 says, Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, what, what has to happen for him to be glorified? He has to be uh, crucified and raised from the dead. It says in the Bible that he has given up, and he came in a lowly fashion in, in a form of flesh. And it, he had previous glory with God. 
Verse 21 of 1 Peter says, Whom through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So verse 21 says that he was given glory. Now, it says, through him we believe. Well, that's true. The Word says he's the author and the finisher of our faith, right? And it also says that he's the object of our faith. So it's because of Christ that we have salvation. So you think about this. You know, when, when the Word says that God foreknew him, or foreordained him, it says the same thing about us. But we're a lot different than Christ. Because Christ is the lamb who was worthy. We are not worthy. See, we are, we've come from no, not a people, from no people to be his people. Um, I like in Corinthians where it says, God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. You see? This world thinks backwards in what we do. We think opposite of each other. Why, why does God do all this stuff? Because all the glory goes to God. When he takes the underdog, when he takes the foolish things, when he takes the not my people and makes them his people, it's him, him, him doing the work. It's him doing it, not us. Look at Romans 8, 29. There he's talking about us. For those whom he foreknew, and this is the same word, foreknow. Foreknew, foreknow, foreordained. He also predestined. To be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So, how did he foreknow us? Is this just talking about a future knowledge of what we will do? No. It's the same word, the same foreknowing of his son, but at a different level. Obviously, he loves his son. You know, you think, well, God can't have different levels of, or different types of love. Well, sure he can he loves his only begotten son in a way different than everything else. God is love. Does he love his only begotten son in a different way than he loves the Philistine? Of course. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Remember in the beginning I was talking about translations, how... Different translation uses different words. Well, the Holman back in 1 Peter, it says this. Talking about Jesus, he was chosen before the foundations of the world. So it translates that word for no to chosen. So could you read this? For those whom he chosen, he also predestined. That's the same, it's the same thing. Foreknowing is choosing. It's setting a special love upon him. For those whom he chosen, he also predestined. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Verse 22 in uh, 1 Peter says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. How many times does the Bible reference truth? It's all over the place, guys. Truth is all over. The Do you think the truth is important? I mean, uh, it starts off, the Bible starts off with a lie. I mean, not at the beginning, but like in, in chapter 2, the serpent tells Adam and Eve a lie. And that's where it rolls and it, it starts going. You always, you have this lie and then you have the truth. And it's always been there. Since that day forward, you've had a, a series of lies coming from the devil and you have a series of truths coming from God in his word. And which are we going to believe, the lie or the truth? And let me tell you, the, the, the serpent quoted the word of God, but not verbatim. Did God really say? He, he, he brought up what God said, 
And he got them stuck in there. Now go on to to the next part of the verse. It says, For a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Well, this is what we're called to do. We're called to love one another. Now, we do this because we have a new heart. We're not the old person. We shouldn't act like the world. We're not part of the world anymore. We're of a new creation. See, in the first part, it says that we're being purified to the obedience. It says, uh, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Well, somebody say, well, pastor, there you go. You've got to do something. Of course you've got to do something. Once God wakens you up and he calls you out of that, that tomb, it says, come forth. Now it's time to start working for the Lord. It's time to obey the gospel. It's time to do his work. Now, if you have a new heart and the Holy Spirit in you, you're going to want to work for Christ. If you don't, then you won't want to work for him. Now, this is the same thing when it comes to brotherly love. We're not called to uh, have coldness towards each other. We're not. We're not called to brush each other off. Are we called to uh, be indifferent about our brothers and sisters that are having troubles? Oh, that's okay. I'll pray for you. You know? Are we called to, 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 to serve each other? It's what we're called to do. To humble ourselves, to serve each other. Look at our master, wash the feet. Okay? Well, do we have a different standard of love for the poor as we do for the rich? Hey, man, you're going to donate for my roof of the church. First of all, it's God's roof. But remember that the economy of God is upside down compared to the, the, the desires of the world. It doesn't matter if you're poor or rich. I think it was uh, somebody had said one time, well, it's in the Bible, but uh, remember the lady that just gave all that she had? The little bit that she had and she put in the offering. And Jesus said that woman gave more than anyone else. Because she gave out of an abundance of her heart. You see. Sometimes because somebody's not a leader. We don't, we don't give them the same respect as the followers. Um, we have to have genuine love for one another. Not like the world does. The world will stab you in the back in a heartbeat, right? We have to, in, 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 in love, we have to let things slide off. There are certain things, you know, you, you let things go, but then there are certain things you have to correct. Verse 23 says this, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Well, we're born again. Here we go. We're talking about being born again. What, what, what makes something imperishable? Think about this. You ever go to Walmart and they got... Shh. You ever go to Walmart and they got... Um, when you go there to buy something, the lady will ask you, Do you want a warranty? What do you say? You always say no, right? Or who, who in here says yes all the time? Matthew, he's broke all the time, that's why. <laughs> but you go to Walmart, and the lady asks you, she goes, you want a warranty with that? Do you want a one-year, two-year, three-year warranty with that? Or sometimes when you go buy a vehicle, they give you a, a, an extended warranty, right? So if you have an extended warranty, what if you walked into Walmart and the lady says, uh, how many year warranty you want? And you said, I would like an eternal warranty. A what? An eternal warranty. Think about it. That's what I'm telling you. Things here perish. What if you, what if, how much would an eternal warranty cost? Remember they add money on to the price of your item for every year? If you said, I want an eternal warranty, how much would that cost? You don't have that much money. But guess what? 
Jesus' blood paid the price for our eternal warranty. That's how precious his blood is, is he paid that price for our eternal warranty. Now, how much does it cost us? It's free. It doesn't cost us a thing. An eternal warranty is paid for by Christ. So if you're born of imperishable seed, that means that you can't die again. You're born again of imperishable seed. You can't. So here in the next verse it says, Through a living and abiding word of God. Well, can we cause life? So if I'm trying to get this eternal warranty, can I, can I do anything for it? No. Because anything temporal that I can put in is perishable. Can I say to somebody, let there be life in you? No. Do I have the power to create life? Do you have the power to create life in someone else? No. Anything we do is temporal here on this earth is, is temporal with the exception of things we do for the Lord, which is eternal. So, remember in the garden, we were back there in the, in the garden already at the very first verse of the Bible, let there be. God says, let there be light. Let there be this. He's the creator. So, Remember that, that chalkboard, creator, write the word creator, draw a line, creature, put it underneath. That's where we're at. We're under the creator. We're not even with the creator. We're completely dependent on him and his glory and his grace. We can't do things apart from him. And here's the thing. If it's all his work that saves us, then it's an eternal salvation. Once we add something to that, to that formula, it becomes non-eternal. When it's his, him working, not us. So it's all God. And remember this, this is talking about why does God allow such things to happen? Because it's all his work that saves us. He saves us out of this wickedness and this evil. That he saves us to, to, a, to a salvation. If you read Romans chapter 8, it's around verse 23 or 24. It's talking about that God gets glory from us having grace and for allowing the wicked to continue into perishing. You read that. I mean, God gets glory. Now, for all flesh is like the grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls. I think about this. When, when, remember in the Bible, the Lord says that he's going to come back on harvest day? Is he going to be driving a John Deere or an international harvester? Or, or what, what, what's the angels going to have? You know, we see the picture of the sickle and stuff. Well, I think about this imperishable seed. You know, when it comes to inventions, Sean, I think I have a picture here. Can you put up the first picture? Remember the first version of Windows? <laughs> and we just had to have it, right? You had to have Windows. You had, well, except for Roy. You had to have it. Or the first phone, like the, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about, remember they had written them purses? The, the battery was bigger than the phone itself, and you had to carry it around, probably weighed 20 pounds. And now, in a couple of years, whatever I'm carrying, holding up now is a phone's going to be obsolete. Maybe it'll just be embedded into my head. Who knows what's coming in the future, right? Now, this changed a lot of lives, right? It made a lot of lives better, in some ways worse. Uh, go to the next picture, Sean. This right here is a, um, a reaper. This is uh, an invention 
that was invented by a Scottish minister named Patrick Bell in 1828. And what it's doing is cutting the wheat. And it's laying the wheat off to the side. You, you hear the song, Bring in the Sheaves? Bringing in the Sheaves? Don't make me sing. Okay, so this wheat that's laying off to the side gets bundled up into round, you know, stalks. And they bring it in. Okay. Well, this guy comes up with this idea. Instead of using a sickle and stuff, well, you know, he's going to use these horses and make this thing like this. Well, uh, he never filed a patent on this. He felt that, you know, he says, uh, he said he was a man of God and, and the, the, the uh, invention that he made should benefit all men. Well, a couple of years later, there was two people to come out. And one of them was named Cyrus Hall McCormick. And from him came the company International. Man, if you study this stuff, this is pretty interesting. This guy McCormick and Hiram Moore got into a couple feuds over patents, okay? Because they were trying to invent. Uh, McCormick was actually credited with the... Uh, with the reaper because no one else filed a patent. So McCormick was doing it. But the thing was, was more, they believed that, that, that McCormick stole all the ideas from Moore. And back in the 1800s, they sued each other for $40,000. And can you imagine how much money that is today? $40,000 back in the 1800s. Wow. Well, why do I say all this? Well, first of all, let me finish telling you a story. McCormick, or Moore, invented the combine. Later, years later, a couple years later, not many, he invented what was called the combine. And we see him driving up and down the road here. Why do they call them combines? Anybody know? Because there are three steps, three basic steps to gathering wheat. Well, this was a reaper. A reaper was just cutting the wheat down and laying it off to the side. But a combine combined all three steps into one machine. So they had reaping and then threshing. And this is all biblical. Remember when you read in the Bible, when they thresh, they're, they're beating the, the stalks of wheat, knocking the grain off the stalks. And then the next thing is winnowing or separating the chaff. And what they would do is they throw the seed up in the air and the wind would blow and the chaff, the little things that are around the wheat, would blow away. And then you have wheat laying on the ground underneath. Well, these, uh, th these three guys come up with the uh, combine. And the combine combined all them parts. So when it goes through the field, not, it, it, it reaps, it threshes, and it separates the chaff from the wheat. So that was pretty important. Could you imagine... What would it be like today if we had to go out and cut these wheat fields down by hand? Could you imagine that? How would we feed all these people if we all had, maybe we wouldn't be in so much trouble. We'd have something to do to occupy our time, right? <laughs> but we'd have to go out and cut all the wheat down by hand. Well, this was a really important invention. Oh, and can you imagine this? It took 30 horses to push this thing. 30 horses. The big problem with this combine was is they had a lot of trouble turning it around. Could you imagine 30 horses? You could only go like 20 feet in one direction then start your turn because there's so many horses. Then they come up with the steam engine combine. Roy, could you imagine having a fire, contained fire in the middle of a wheat field? There's so many wheat fires that we go to around here. They all... It's, did you know that wheat dust is explosive? If you get a bunch of dust in the air and light a match, it's going to go boom, it's going to explode. Don't do it. Now, what am I getting to here? These inventions were really important, right? And I think they needed it to occur. But are they something that has an eternal reward? No. We th if we think earthly-minded, then they're very, very, very important. The world couldn't survive without them. 
But an eternal reward is an eternal reward. Think about it. So, if you've got a penny a day for your lifetime, how much money would you, I don't want, don't answer it, I don't know, I'm not good at math, but think about it, how much money would you have? But what if you got a penny a day for in an eternity? That's a lot, that's a lot of reward. So, my point is, is if you're doing eternal work, you get an eternal reward. If you're doing earthly work, which is important, God tells us to work, you get an earthly reward. But an eternal work comes with eternal reward. And what's more important to have, an eternal reward or an earthly reward? An, an eternal reward. This comes from this, uh, the grass fading comes from uh, Isaiah 40, verse 3 through 8. I'm going to read it because it, uh, it deals with John the Baptist and, and, that, and then it talks about all flesh is grass. It says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be re revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now here, a voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades, and the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but our word of God will stand forever. Don't think earthly, in earthly ways. Think eternally, okay? Because the things of this earth will fade and fall away. But eternal rewards are stored up in heaven where rust and moss and all that stuff cannot hinder. So when you think about, hey, am I going to do something for the Lord? Think about it. The things you do for the Lord come with an eternal reward. Remember the lady just put a, a little penny or something in the offering and that was all she had? She's, got, she's been rewarded, or get, she'll get rewarded from him for an eternity. So even the little things that you do for the Lord here have an eternal reward there. I want you to start thinking not of earthly things, but of heavenly things. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you, Lord. I just uh, give you the praise and the honor and the glory, Lord, that... Lord, if you keep our minds set on heavenly things and not earthly things, Lord, because the earthly things are, um, are fading away, Lord, and they will fade away. But your word remains forever. And, Lord, you remain forever. Lord, we know that our inheritance is you. You're un unperishing. Lord, you're unfading. And, Lord, we just thank you for that. Lord, help us uh, think in our minds in a different light, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.